Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Hey, everyone. Before we get started with the show, I'm excited to announce two things. First is that my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed, is now live on Amazon. So go get it. The second thing is we have a new sponsor, Qualified.com. I'm going to tell you about them in the next couple seconds here and also how you can get a free copy of my book thanks to them. So who are these people? Well, Qualified is the number one live chat and chatbot platform for Salesforce and Pardot. Sales reps can have real-time, personalized conversations with who? Your hottest website visitors. So I want you to know, I don't just partner with anyone. I genuinely love these guys. And the platform, we use it at my company. Our sales team loves it. We've closed a lot of deals based on it. Um, had a lot of great conversations with prospects too. So, you know, a lot of marketing these days is what? Hurry up and wait right? Fill out this form. And then if we pass you over to sales, maybe you'll swap six emails with them to find a good time to talk. But what if a prospect is doing research right now and they would chat now? Why not give them the opportunity? So the best part is your company actually decides what leads are worth a live chat. There's a lot of noise out there. You don't want to talk to everyone. So Qualified actually connects to Salesforce and Pardot and it's able to pull in lead and contact information so you can specifically know if you're talking to a VIP, a VP, a decision maker. It's really kind of like magic. Now, if you don't know who someone is, well, what happens then, Casey? Well, that's when the bots come in handy. Chat bots can then ask you know, questions to further qualify a lead. Find out if maybe this is someone you do want to talk to. And they can book meetings while your sales team is out. And they can wake up the next morning with a bunch of meetings on their calendar. Now, here's the promo. If you are a company that wants to give your sales team this ability, right, to be able to talk to decision makers right when they're on your website, do this. Go to qualify.com and start a chat, right? They use their own tool, of course. Start a chat. Tell them that Casey sent you. If you have Salesforce Pardot, when you schedule and then do a demo, they will send you a free copy of my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed. Not bad, right? Well, it's only while supplies last. So, Hop on this thing today. And that's it for sponsors. Let's get to the show. Boom, there it is. We're live. Okay, guys, the guest today, his name is doubly cool, but we're not going to get to the name just yet because I got to tell you about him. He is a marketing coach, a consultant, a fractional CMO. He says he's the number one fractional CMO. Let's see if that is true by the end of this show. Speaker, mentor, uh, podcast host of a, the serial podcast called Marketing Sucks. <laughs> and he's got a new one coming out called Your Perfect Marketing Strategy. Founder of CMO X, Casey Slaughter Stanton. Welcome to the show. Hey, Casey. Good to be here. Is it weird that we're saying our, our name to each other? Is that weird? Have you had a podcast yet with another Casey? You know, I haven't, but I do feel like um, like there's an Irish heritage that's kind of coming out of me as I look yes. at these, like a uh, four-leaf clover hat. Ah, to be sure. To be sure. Well, let's get some Guinness. <laughs> I'd love to. And, and hey, not only is your first name the best first name there is, your middle name is actually Slaughter. Yeah, my grandmother was a cattle rancher out in uh, uh, West Texas and Arizona, and um, Katie Slaughter, you know, real badass woman. Uh, so the family just passed that name along, and my father's a slaughter, and I'm a slaughter. It's pretty exciting. Damn. Well, we're going we're gonna to slaughter some myths today. Absolutely. So this, this is our marketing leadership series. We're here to just talk strategies, get to the real deal. Now, I'm going to pass you this thing to help you with the slaughtering. It's really heavy, but I'm pretty sure you can handle it. Okay, here you go. This is Thor's hammer. Go ahead, grab that. You got it? Yeah. You got it. Oh, one-handed. Damn, people. <laughs> All right, so Casey, take that Thor's hammer, right? The Thor's hammer, actually. The real one. It's here in Nashville, New Hampshire now. Take that. Smash for me. Slaughter for me. Some kind of myth, bogus strategy, misconception in the marketing world that just drives you crazy. You want to set the record straight once and for all. All right. I got an easy one for you. Yeah. I think social media is an absolute waste of time. Nine times out of 10. What? You're, are you, are you crushing social media right at the beginning? Shots fired people. What's going on? Yes, really? Social media is typically used as a stay busy crutch in businesses. 
instead oh, of actually doing something that drives a sale, people have conversations. And if you need to grow your business, you need to be having sales conversations. And what is a sales conversation? It's a conversation with someone who has the financial abilities and the authority to say yes to your offer. If you're talking on social media, how many of those people are you actually having sales conversations with? Yeah. Are you just saying, is he like, no one, no one cares what you think. Like either you tell them something that helps them. Okay. That's interesting. Or you solve a problem that they have. And if I'm going to solve a problem, I want to have them on the phone. If my team's solving problems. We have people on the phone. We're not doing it through social media. I guess there's a time and a place for social media, but it's after you have a very strong direct response marketing strategy. And I want to offer this book here. This is how to create irresistible offers by Robert Bly. Great book. And he's got this little graph here in the introduction. And oh, you're holding it up to the street. Do that again. No, just people, if you want to see this, you just hop on YouTube, guys. Okay. Yeah. So what it says here is that when you have a brand-driven offer, when the content is 90% brand, it costs approximately $800 to $1,000 a sale. So that's saying when you lead with branding, when you lead with conversation, when you lead with kind of the soft it costs eight hundred to a thousand dollars a sale. Okay. On the flip side, if you lead with the offer, so only ten percent brand, ninety percent offer content, the average sale cost is fifty to a hundred dollars. What? What but is I'm going saying, on here? What? What time warp am I in? So you're not. You know, you're not Nike. I'm not Coca Cola, right? We don't have yeah. these unlimited branding budgets, so we can't look to these juggernauts in the space and expect to have uh, the same abilities and pull that they have with their like literal billion dollar marketing budgets. Right. Yes, they can be um, branding based. Sure. And I think that that's sexy. And I think that a lot of folks um, in social media want to win internet awards for having like the most innovative branding. And I don't know about you, Casey, but can you pay your mortgage with an internet award? Yeah. <laughs> what? The bank doesn't take that as collateral? <laughs> right. So Seriously. if you want to make money, you need to have a direct offer and it needs to be a crystal clear offer. And you need to be able to show proof on it. And social media is a way to maybe have some of that conversation. Um, but most businesses do social media first and then work on their offer later. And therefore, they're wasting all of their time or their client's time or their money or, or their employee's time or whatever on crappy social media. Huh. Okay, let's break this down because my knee-jerk reaction when you were saying that, it, when you're like lead with the offer instead of the soft, you go in hard, you go in swinging and punching is like the terrible like – you know, worst, you know, cold call email where it's like, Hey, buy this thing right now. The Glen Gary leads like buy this thing. But it sounds like that makes it a cheaper sale. Could you could like clarify maybe the brand driven versus the, the direct, more direct approach and what, what you really mean by each one of those? Yeah. If you've ever run an ad that yeah. says something like we make a difference or our solutions are superior, oh. right? that kind of stuff, waste of everyone's time. I, I was out for a walk with my wife the other day. We live in Philadelphia and there was a billboard and it just had some platitude on it. Like we make business work. Uh, and it's like, <laughs> okay. What are you in finance? Are you in legal? Like, are you software? Like no call. It, it's a brand name and then a tagline. We make business. work. I see. Or like um, we empower business solutions. It's just like, what is that even like? Are you architecture? Are you, are you AWS? Like, what are you? Yeah. That's brand driven. That is a platitude and is a waste of everyone's time. And if you run that ad, I guarantee you, you will not make your money back. Like it's just, I, I know someone who, a company who ran a um, five figure media buy and they had a platitude ad like that. Five figures. Like, yeah. Congrats. They got on their website, like, 20 visits and none of those people opted in. And obviously then none of them bought it's because wow. they had a terrible offer. If instead they had a better offer and I'm not saying you got to be like pushy. Right. Although I think a little, I, I think that most businesses could become a little pushier, could become a little more clear, could have a little bit more force or like loving force. 
And, and what I think of this as is, what force would you use, Casey, to stop a child from running into the street? What oh. force would you use to stop yeah. a kid from touching a hot stove? Oh, yeah. Right? Totally. You I did that. that. My, my, back in the day, my daughter was on one of, like, I remember being a little toddler and running toward the street, and then you freak out, and I'm like, look, I'm sorry I freaked out and scared you, but I need you to remember this and, like, lock this into your brain that you can't do that. That's dangerous. Remember that for all time. You know, right. so yeah, I freaked out and made sure they knew something was special about the road. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. most businesses have a product or a service or some kind of offering that is critical to some aspect of business. I mean, sure, yeah. Casey, like you're not dealing with cancer, let's say, but part of that's pretty important, right? When your company, right. works part of it, like it's pretty mission critical. Right. For the business. And our clients could be for sure. Right, exactly. And if you didn't force your clients to adopt this thing or do things in a certain way, they're going to have a failure and mm. you're going to be kind of complicit in it because you didn't give them the force that was needed. You didn't give them the pressure that was needed to take action, to do mm -hmm. something different. Right. And if you lay that out and say, these are the things, these are the reasons, this is why you should absolutely take action. And if you choose not to, that's on you. Okay. Then I think that that's fine. Um, but most businesses are just too soft and too platitude and just too weak and too soft kid gloved on things that are just like afraid to piss someone off. Yeah. Listen, if one person a day isn't mad at you for your marketing, you're not working hard enough. Uh. Like you got to find that edge. You got to find that edge where what you're saying is true, what you're saying is helpful and what you're saying is clear. And like, someone's going to be like, Hey man, I hate this. You're like, okay, cool. Like, Hit the little, you know, the X on the top of the ad and say, don't show me these again. But for everybody else, thanks for buying. Right. Right. Uh, that was a good point. If you're not afraid to piss someone off. I mean, what is that quote? There was some famous leader that was like, you know. If, if I think Dan Kennedy said something along those lines. Yeah. In marketing. Yeah. And I think it's so true. Like, look at your marketing. Is there, is there polarization? Let's talk about storytelling. Um, yeah. If you think of any Disney movie. Where there's conflict, there's attention, right? Like yeah. conflict attention. What happens in a movie theater during a fight scene? Everyone is riveted. What happens after, you know, someone gets killed? Right. Everyone like runs to the bathroom, right? Then they come back. Like when there's no <laughs> conflict, there's just no attention. Right. So the question is, are you creating conflict in your copy? Most social media is like sunny days, happy, smiley thoughts. And it doesn't have this kind of, position of conflict like it's you against something your company right. has an enemy what is your enemy you know maybe your enemy is as simple as the do nothing right either you do nothing or you take right action like that could be your enemy like laziness or sloth or whatever gluttony but your enemy could also be a certain type of business, a certain yeah. person, like you competitor, can have competitor, anything. Yeah. A competitor. The yeah. Government. Yeah. David, who's your Goliath? Like you have to peg yourself against someone to create conflict, to create attention. And social media rarely does that. It can, it absolutely can. But most businesses fail to lead with a good offer. And instead they kind of rest on their brand and no one cares about their brand. No, yeah, no one cares. No one cares. I, I think we do way talk about ourselves too much. Talk all about what we do, how great we are. Like yep. people don't care. I think the worst offender for me is the email that says, "We have a new website. Come check it out." It's like, I don't Ooh. give a shit about your website. I didn't, right. and I still don't, even if it's new. Like, I'm not gonna do that. What? And it's like you just wasted that opportunity. You got my attention enough to read that you sent a terrible email out. Like, don't do that. Garbage. Yeah. yeah. I have a new website. Yeah. Waste of my time. And that goes into another thing I want to smash here. I think yeah. most emails that people receive are garbage. I think most emails that businesses send are trash. Why? Because it's platitudes. I think you'll come to realize that I hate platitudes. Yeah. You and, said that word a couple of, that's probably the more I've heard that word this whole year. This is yeah. cool. This is a platitude episode. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I think that most emails are bullshit. I think most emails that come out are, um, like, let, let's just go back to what's the point of an email subject line? Okay. Point of an email subject line is to get the email opened. What's the point of an email body? It's to get a link clicked. Okay. 
if you, if you own that as a truism in your business, you're going to get people to take action. You're going to create this Pavlovian response. I get an email from Casey. I open it. I click it. I go to the thing, right? You want to create that. But when you start sending people emails that are just a complete waste of time, yeah, they're not going to have that response. They're not going to care about your emails. They're not going to open your emails in the future. And you're right. going to be stuck with an email list that's big, 1,000, 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 with low open rates. Like if your open rates are below 15%, like someone's asleep at the job. Yeah, something's happening. And like your click-through rates, like you, you need to have click-through rates that are on par with what your offer is. I don't expect 100% click-through rate, but I expect, you know, a decent number. What, what is a decent number to you? Yeah, it's, it's kind of across the board because the offers are always different. Yeah. Uh, I want to say that one of the things I love doing is having people reply to the emails. Yeah. So don't go to this page to fill out a form. Just hit reply and give me your answer. Mm, I like that. Right. I, there's a couple things here with email that I like. And, and you're the email king, so I'm sure you, you have better tips than me. Uh, but what I like is I like emails to come from a person. Stop having emails come from the company. Yeah. The last time you spoke to a company, it never, right? You talk to a person at a company. Why would an email come from the management? It's like, right. it's annoying. So the email should come from someone. <clears throat> oh, you don't have someone? Well, I mean, you sure, you could create a artificial person at your organization mm -hmm. if you needed to, right? Just Nancy at whatever. It's like always a Nancy, can, isn't it? It really is oh, always a Nancy. Yeah. Do you know a Nancy? I don't, I, not really, no. But I'll introduce you to one. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, no, keep going. Right. Yeah. So make, do make it someone, but make it someone that you can write back to. Yeah, yeah. None of this no reply. I hate know. that, you yeah. know? And, and you're right. I think I, I loved your, your idea of like, just reply to get the action. Sometimes I'll do a webinar and I'll say, just type three letters or type something into the chat and we'll follow up with you. I mean, the idea of, clicking through to a landing page and this and this and this. If we know who you are, if you can just hit reply, yeah, it doesn't get tracked in our system. It's not as scalable, but it's, if it's easier, then go for it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, and I think, so the emails need to come from someone. I think the subject lines need to be readable. Mm. What emails do you always open? No matter what, what emails do you always open? Just like for the listeners here, consider, what emails do you always open? Emails from your mom, emails yeah. from sibling, emails from your spouse, emails from your kid, whatever, right? Yeah. And the subject lines are pretty similar, you know? Um, They're not they, good at writing subject lines, right? They're just these little, like, imperfect little things that are like curious and little and they're not capitalizing every word they're not being like super marketers in their subject lines hey right. dad such and such my offer have you considered my kid wants to you know, know. get him like a switch or something and they're like have you considered my offer that i wrote i had to write up an essay she's like, have you considered my offer in the subject no she's not doing that right like mm -hmm. hey dad right something right. simple in the subject yeah. yeah totally so those will get a higher open rate yeah and use them so like simple ones, quick question. Are you free on Saturday? Yeah. Um, if you're doing like a, a Facebook Live or a webinar or something, are you free on Saturday? Free next Tuesday at 3 p.m., right? That's going to get opened 100% of the time. I mean, your open rates on those things, um, we're seeing some of our clients get open rates of north of 60%. Mm. Because they're very personal. And they're not bait and switch. Like that's really important that we don't bait. Uh, good point. But we shouldn't say, um, exclusive live broadcast with yada yada you know just say like are you free yeah 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 yeah, yeah I, I i struggle with that too right because you want to can sometimes we try to convey too much but to your point and i love how you said this the truism here subject line get it open body yeah. get the link click like or a reply get an action to happen. It, yeah. and use each one of those things in their own time and place don't try to get the link click in the subject like just get the open and that way your, su your subject isn't, you know, terribly stuffed full of keywords. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And there really is an art to writing a good subject line. You know, I, hmm. if you're sending, there's, there's two types of emails. So, right, so for everyone listening, consider emails kind of in two ways. I, I guess there's three. Um, there's transactional emails, which are like your receipts kind of forget about those here. Yeah. In this situation. But the other two are broadcasts and then sequences and a broadcast is, Oh shoot, something's come up. Let's shoot everyone an email and send it today. 
And a sequence is more like when you come in and you opt in for this thing or you become a customer or whatever, we have yeah. a hundred day long sequence that we're going to send you emails on. And most businesses underutilize that first hundred days. There's a great book by a guy named Joey Coleman called the first hundred days. And he talks about how at a bank, if you become a customer at a bank and you stick around for a hundred days, you, you won't leave. Like you'll be there for 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. You're in the first hundred days that matter. It's too hard to change that shit for sure. Yeah. It's super hard. Yeah. Similarly with like a CRM, right? When you get into a SaaS CRM, like yeah. if, you've done, if you've like moved all your contacts, if you've like learned it, then yeah. you're not leaving, even if it sucks a little bit. So what is your sequence? What sequences do you have in your business is the question for the listener. And do you have good emails for it? And do you review them and do you optimize them? Yeah. That's way more important than an email newsletter. Like an email newsletter telling you like who we hired and, you know, notes from the CEO. It's just like a waste of everyone's time. But if instead it's a hundred day email series that says, welcome, we're excited to have you. Here's what you got to know and educate people along the way to show them all the value that you provide because you provide value. Mm -hmm. like, and they don't know it. That's a great way to use email. You know, I hate newsletters too, but I guess because you're bringing it up, I'll sort of defend them for a moment. I'll have to sure. take a shower afterward, but, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the marketing du jour. A lot of groups that all they, all they sort of have the willpower to do is, and it might as well be on paper or on email, just make that thing once a month. That's their, that's their newspaper, you know, and, and it just goes out and doesn't it, I guess if I had to defend it in court, um, this is why I'm not a defense attorney, but if I had like, isn't it keeping a touch point with your customers beyond the hundred days? And it would, if you can't put in some things that, are, you know, that the information changes all the time, you want to get that information out. And yeah, you know, then the news I, that, that's, that's important. Um, so just to kind of clarify my position, most people use social media instead of having a clear offer and being more direct and asking yeah. for the sale. Most people use email to hide behind the kind of arduous project of writing an email newsletter. It's not easy. Yeah. So they do this stay busy work instead of be effective. So I'm not against a newsletter, but do you have a good series uh, when people opt in? Do you have a good series for new customers? Like how's your opt-in, I guess Russell Brunson would call it a um, indoctrination campaign, <laughs> right? Like, how's that? Or how's your first hundred days series? Like, do you have those built? If you have those built, then people know you and like you've earned the opportunity to talk to them later. And then newsletters, sure, they can make sense. And if you're going to send newsletters, you got to do this pre-work that I'm talking about and you have to have good subject lines, then have a purpose for your newsletter. Like you should be looking at your newsletter stats and saying, like, you should have a hypothesis. Okay, so you brought up a hypothesis. Yep. Isn't it true that sending an email newsletter gives people an update and it's a good touch point? It's a good hypothesis and it's, yep. it's possibly true, but are you getting enough opens? How much time does it take to write all the content and do all this stuff and put it yeah. online? And how many people are reading it? And is it easier for your marketer just to call these people and tell them one off instead of doing this thing? Uh, that's seriously. A bad idea, right? A marketer shouldn't be doing these sales calls. But we're looking at efficacy here. So for like business owners, are you focused on the right thing? That's what's so critical here. Are you focused on a be busy task or like what so many marketers do, which is let's have a checklist of all the marketing campaigns we should be running and let's make sure we're running all of them at the same time, which is counter to the businesses that are very successful who run right. a handful of campaigns expertly well and have great numbers and they're always testing against it. Those businesses win. The businesses that do a do everything, um, the marketers are out of breath. They're exhausted. They have crappy results. They're never doing anything long enough to get a result that's positive. They're not testing. Yeah. It's garbage. I love it, right? Have an hypothesis. And I think what I like about your approach here is it's the true marketing approach, which is cool. Anything could work. You know, there's some things that we've learned we should avoid. Yeah, almost like cooking, right? There's certain tastes, hmm, mayonnaise and that ingredient, like some right. things are off limit. Like, nope, I'm not gonna let you experiment with that because I don't wanna see you throw up. But some other things, um, maybe that would work. Let's try it out. And so you just brought up like, hey, what's your hypothesis? Your hypothesis is this newsletter will do what? It'll take this action in, as this result. And then you're saying, okay, let's hold it accountable. Is it actually doing that? And I think maybe that's something 
that if someone is listening to this and you're doing a newsletter, it's like, why don't you start holding that newsletter more accountable? Because yeah. maybe there's a better way to do it. And if you, if you treat your salespeople with accountability, yeah, right? you say to a salesperson, all right, I'm going to pay you base plus commission. Yeah. That's common. Some people would just have just commission, right? Yeah. That's sales. Well, what is marketing? Like the definition of marketing that I believe is marketing is salesmanship multiplied. So it's a salesperson can knock on a door and sell to someone direct, or they can call someone and sell to someone direct. Marketing is the ability to do that to more people at once. So for instance, instead of selling to one door, I write an ad, put it in the Wall Street Journal, it goes out to 100,000 homes. That one ad is then multiplied. My salesmanship multiplied, right? That's marketing. So why would you treat your marketers different than your salespeople? And right. the answer is because you don't believe marketing should produce sales. You should, most people think marketing should produce word of mouth that doesn't really have any metric to track it. It should mm. produce kind of a change in the, like the feeling of the market, right? Like there's this, there's this emotional thing that's immeasurable that businesses believe marketing should do. And I think, cool, go ahead. And then, you know, my clients will kill you, you know? <laughs> because we're doing like marketing yeah. that actually has a clear message with a clear offer. Right. You know, this, you know what? It doesn't need to be disguised as like a greasy sales call. Like we don't have to be Jordan Belfort in a boiler room selling penny stocks to people. Right. right? Yeah. We can be above board, but we can also be clear. I feel like that, that's like your quote. Like if anything makes it onto the social media waves to promote this, even though knowing what we know and how we feel about social, we'll, st we'll still want to promote this show and episode. But like that quote you said, the idea of marketing is salesmanship multiplied. Like, yeah, it's, it's like, I, sometimes I'll call it carrying at scale, you know, yeah. um, the idea of just getting out there and being there. And, and I think the, um, the accountability is so important. You know, just, you know, one final nail, if I could, on the, on the newsletter coffin is the idea of the content that goes in there and, and it can be really challenging. And, you know, one thing that's happened to me, I wrote for a magazine in New Hampshire. It was like a little travel magazine and New Hampshire. We're like, we're like, yay big. We're like tiny as a state, you know, we're not Rhode Island. Right. But we're not Texas either. So mm -hmm. there's only so many things you can do. And I remember the first couple, the first year or two, there's a bunch of things to write about, but eventually you've run out of things to write about in your travel magazine for New Hampshire because you've done it all. And yeah. so I see that same kind of thing happening with marketers and, and newsletters is you first get there, you're excited, you put some great content in there, which should be in their 100 day thing that you talked about. Put that really good stuff in there so that everyone gets it. But the problem is Everybody. you've already done that. So if you keep writing and writing and writing a year and a half into your marketing gig, you've basically written about everything you can think about. And now you're just stuck doing the busy work that you talked about. And it's like, it, you're not even in, you're not enthusiastic about it. It yeah. sucks. And then eventually you're bored and you go get some other job and you write for a company you're excited to write for again, you know? And so rather than doing that, I, I like the idea of grabbing your best posts and putting them in this hundred day thing so that everyone can get your best articles. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's nothing wrong with writing newsletters, especially yeah. if it's a form of content creation. Yeah. Just know that that content then gets created and like you said, repurpose it at some point. Yeah. But like, one of the things that I did was I, I said, I want to do a podcast. Okay. Right? I want to do a podcast. And a lot of people in our space do a Terrible podcast. idea. You shouldn't do a podcast. No, I'm just kidding. I love podcasting. A lot of people just like just interview the same people who release the same books. And it's just like on a given week, you can see the same guy on 10 different podcasts. And it's like, what, they're like 5% different. It just felt a little lame to me. I didn't want to do that. Right. Sure. And what I decided to do was I created my podcast marketing sucks as a way to help business owners understand what it takes to have marketing that doesn't suck. So marketing mm. sucks when it doesn't drive profit. That's when marketing sucks. Marketing is awesome when it's making you money while you sleep. Yeah. You get that mailbox money, but it sucks when you spend money and you make nothing. Right. So I created my first season and you know, it was a learning experience. It helped me kind of force my ideas out and, and, and kind of clarify them. And as a result, I launched the podcast and I had the result I had. And it was a hypothesis that that was a worthwhile activity. And at the end of, I did eight or nine episodes, I decided, you know what? That's good. That didn't work. I tested it. I created the content. As a podcast, it didn't work for me. 
That was okay. So I retired it. So it's over. There's one season, eight, nine episodes. That's it. I didn't. It, yeah. And it lives. It still lives. So people can still check it out. Yeah. Yeah. But what I did was I took that content and then took and built more on top of it off the podcast. Yeah. I continued to build on it. So I used the podcast as an opportunity to force myself to create something and just like try the medium and, and get yeah. into it. I liked it. And now I've reconsidered that whole hypothesis. And it's very clear to me that talking to people is the most important thing, mm. like for generating new ideas and getting like a different perspective and walking around problems. Oh yeah. And I want to do that. So that's why I'm releasing a new podcast, but it's different and it is on purpose. Here's the worst thing that's going to happen for me from my podcast. I'm going to talk to experts and I'm going to understand what's working in marketing today. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. No one listens and you're still way smarter and you made a new friend, you know? Right. Right. And if you, it, yeah. if it, the marketers here are SEO folks, transcribe all the episodes, boom, you got all the on-page SEO. Like it's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing to be able to do. And it's pretty simple and straightforward, but it's a hypothesis. I tested, I worked it. I didn't like the result. So then I just stopped. I didn't say, oh shoot, I have to release every episode, an episode every Wednesday at noon until I'm dead. <laughs> right. So I think that that's, that's kind of like another myth here that I want to smash, which is you don't have to do something forever. Okay. Right? Like people think I have to run a newsletter forever. No, no you don't. You just run it until you feel like it's ran its course and then you can take some space and reconsider. People don't really care about your newsletter, probably. I mean, unless you have a great newsletter, you know, there's some businesses that, like the Agora businesses that like are newsletter based businesses. And right. That's very different. But to your but point, if you, if no one emails you and is like, where's the newsletter then there's your, there's your, <laughs> right. Oh, you did a newsletter. Yeah. For five years we did a newsletter. Oh, okay. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I archive anything like that that goes into my promotions folder anyway. So yeah, right? Right. that's the kind of stuff that you hear. Yeah. So I think, no, I, know, I, think I like that though. That's a, it's a really important point because I think sometimes when we're planning things, we're planning them to go forever. We're planning them to scale and we're planning them to go forever. And it's probably smart. And we're like, okay, well, if I blog, I, if I start blogging, I can't stop ever. And I'm going to build all this stuff. No, no I, I love that you, you try something new, try it out, look at the results, start with a plan, hypothesis. Does it work? Yes, no. Maybe do something different or stop it. And then like you're doing, you're modifying something a little bit, doing it again in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm doing it when it makes sense for me. Yeah. Right? Right, with my life, with my, you know, with what I want to do. Yeah. Um, do I have an offer that I can sell on the backside of it? Right. The offer right. From the first podcast was not very clear. Now the offer is very clear. Like I have something to promote in a way that's different. Huh. And I think a lot of businesses have podcasts or do a marketing campaign, whatever the campaign is. Yeah. As an act of like quite literally, I'm staying busy so I don't lose my job. Mm not I'm driving revenue for the business and I'm testing different ideas. Yeah. It's like boss told me to do this. I, mean, I think one significant problem and we can talk about this in a minute, but I think a significant problem is most marketers don't have a framework to make decisions within. Okay. Yeah. And as a result, they just kind of do whatever feels right. They don't have a systematic way to choose the next campaign or to measure a campaign or to review campaigns or to ideate. Like they, all they're doing is saying, Ooh, shoot. I just read on, you know, this website, I was just on Moz's blog and I saw this new thing about SEO. We got to do that right now. <laughs> we know what we're doing for the next 90 days. And sure, we have a little wiggle room in case something urgent comes up. But generally speaking, I know what we're doing for the next 90 days. Everyone's agreed to it. If anyone has new ideas, they're welcome to bring them. They go into this special place and we review them at this interval. And if we decide that we want to take action on them, we can. But so many marketers are doing too much with too poor effort. Uh, you can visualize this, right? As a, as a marketer, um, just think of a circle, which is, you know, you, and then you have like 10, uh, you, you have a 10 foot line that, that you can do on different campaigns for results, right? So you have a circle that's you. And then you have like, if you drove all of your effort into one campaign, you would get the greatest result. Mm -hmm. If you do it into 10, you get a very small result, right? You're kind of like moving very small. Most marketers are doing too much with too little completion, too little effort, too little like rigorous care to mm -hmm. actually drive the result that's required to shift the business. Like, totally. If you look at Airbnb, very simple, 
how did Airbnb get big? Well, they got properties, right? They got places to rent. And then they were like, well, we're going to build our own website, but we don't have traffic. So where'd they get traffic? Craigslist. Really? They got it from a hundred other places, but like 95% of Airbnb's traffic was them posting on all the local Craigslist. <laughs> it worked. Wow. But that was them saying, oh, this, was, this is working here in San Francisco. Let's roll it out everywhere aggressively. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, that's working, but yeah, I don't know, this other thing's kind of working too. Let's try all these 30 other different traffic sources. Yeah. You know? And as a result, Airbnb's Airbnb. Right. Who are suffering right now. But maybe uh, good reason. They are. I'm okay with that. They are. They're definitely getting a wallop. All the, all the renters too and everybody. Um, but yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a good visual that you have 10 feet of rope 10 feet of 10 feet of Twizzlers. Honestly, that's a great, that's a that's great, great visual. And, but you don't, it's like, it's only 10 feet. And so you can put three here, two there, or all 10 on one. But I think sometimes we're like, let's try to put a half a Twizzler on, on like 90 things. I'm right. guilty of this for sure. Here's this cool idea. We get ideas and we want to try things out, but we got to, you know, have the discipline to put them into a future quarter or future month or future plan and not just kind of always be turning and twisting and never being really deliberate or intentional. Yeah. Yes. And there's short and long-term, right? SEO is very much a long-term play. Oh, good call. Yeah. Right? One of our clients wants to rank organically for some keywords. Like I mean, we kind of propose this as like a strategy and to do that, we need 150 articles written. I mean, it's a significant thing to do. How do you write 150 articles? I mean, if there are 500 words a piece and you're spending 10 cents a word, let's say, then you're at 50 bucks. You're at, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's an expensive endeavor. It's 10 grand, 20 grand to be able to build this out. Like that's not a cheap marketing campaign. And it could be more and it's not instantaneous either. Right. Yeah. And you have to do it if you really want to play the game. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to do SEO. You yeah. don't have to, but if you're going to, don't spend two grand on SEO and wonder why it didn't work. Right, because being result eight isn't gonna, doesn't help you. Yeah. yeah. What's the best place to hide a dead body? Page Second page? Yeah. Second page of Google? Yeah. <laughs> or or um, Microsoft Bing <laughs> or Yahoo News. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it's about marketers not knowing what to do, doing yeah. the wrong thing, or doing the right thing with too little effort. Yeah. Uh, and expecting a result that is frankly impossible. And listening right. to people who... Maybe this grinds my gears the most. Listening to people who were lucky. I went on a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat in Italy in 2008. Did so, you really? Yeah. Oh, was, shit. We're talking about that. And that's okay. Go. It was epic. But go ahead. Tell your story first. Yeah. And there's this wonderful man that I met there uh, just before we went silent, right? You had like a day to kind of get to, to kind of like settle in. And then you were silent for 10 days. And then um, Sweet. I got to know him like on the bus ride out, out of town. And really nice guy. He made buku bucks, man. He did this thing with Google ads. He was like advertising on Ask Jeeves. Right? <laughs> Remember Jeeves? Mm -hmm. so he was advertising on Ask Jeeves for um, travel related misspellings. So Abu Dhabi airplane tickets spelled wrong. And he was advertising on that keyword. This is before Google like changed everything, right? Love it. Google like took Ask Jeeves um, ad platform. And Google did a big slap one day and said, no more misspelling. We're gonna auto-correct everyone. So if you're, if you're bidding on these misspellings and getting like some really inexpensive traffic, that's not there anymore. That's a bad user experience. Oh, okay. If you Abu Dhabi wrong, you know, we think that it should be this way. So therefore that whole market's gone. Well, he maintained that whole market himself and his brother uh, in, um, on Ask Jeeves, which was, I mean- Because they didn't change it. Because Ask Jeeves was slower to adopt Google's change. I think Ask Jeeves was the, like powered by Google ads. But oh, then sure. Yeah, yeah. That had like kind of a firewall before that, you know, that rule okay. was adopted or whatever. Yeah, yeah. As a result, this guy was making like 30 grand a day. Wow. And it lasted for like two months. Right? Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable that that happened. I just like couldn't get it out of my head. I was like, holy shit. Like, I want to do that. Impossible to do again. Right. Like no way to do that again no yeah gone forever when we as marketers or business owners listen to people like him mm -hmm. and want to do the impossible like i mean his life forever changed he put a couple million dollars in his pocket you know he and his brother and he just like kicked off and went to meditation retreats and like found himself 
cool dude. Wow. And he, his luck is not a byproduct of clear, focused, programmatic effort that will absolutely win. It's like betting at the roulette table. Yeah. But there's a 48% chance you're going to win. So over time, you will lose. If you follow a good marketing strategy, sorry, there's a 48% chance that you'll win if you bet on black or on, on red, right? Because you got the zero and the double zero. Okay. But I've if never you, done roulette. I should probably use somebody else's money and try that sometime. Yeah. We should talk about that. <laughs> um, but okay, but hold on. But before we get to that, like, so yeah, it, you're, you're doing the roulette. The past wins don't really mean anything. The past wins don't mean anything. And if you continue playing roulette, you will lose. 48% chance means that if you play over the course of a thousand spins, you're going to lose. <laughs> right? It's just, Got it. that's math. Like gambling it's not is 50, 50. It's less than that. So eventually you'll lose. You're out of money. Like that, that's why there's the zero and the double zero is to throw the numbers off. Otherwise you would bet on red and then you'd have a 50% chance of doubling your money. Wow. Right. So then they throw in these, these two green numbers just to screw the numbers up a little bit and get a 2% you know, they have a 52% chance of taking your money and like extrapolate that over every bet of the day, every bet over the year, every bet over right. the lifetime, like they do very well. So as a result, what, what I want to say is most marketers don't have a proven framework to follow that allows them to make the right decision. Right. And as a result, they're always betting on losing bets. Right. And maybe they win short term. Maybe they're like Greg and they figure out this incredible ass Jeeves ad trick, but odds are you're not that that lucky i mean really that's what it is it's just it's absolute luck and as and if you keep trying to bet on being lucky instead of being smart and deliberate and clear and programmatic and like knowing what you're doing you're gonna lose right L listening for that that hot tip somewhere you know the, the roulette thing i i mentioned it briefly but it drives me bonkers when i when i really started thinking about there's this there's this board of numbers where it says like the past 15 numbers that have come up on a roulette yeah. wheel right like it matters. Like, whoa, whoa, eight's looking pretty hot today. You know, <laughs> eight's come up three times in the last 15 spins. Gonna put some money there. And like it has, but like that has no bearing on the future results. And it sounds like the, your friend, right? This is a, a one-off thing and he found some lucky, cool thing, but that doesn't mean that he's a great marketer. It just means he, he might be, but it doesn't, that, that particular strategy is not something you'd want to hang your hat on, place your bet on. Yeah. And like, maybe you spend 1% of your effort looking for that stuff. Okay. You know? But you have to not bet your business on tricks, yeah. on get riches, on get luckies. You know, it's about having the discipline to know what you're doing, to test aggressively, to find winners, to double down on winners and to drive that. And you can't do that if you're doing a hundred marketing campaigns. Mm -hmm. And if your boss is breathing down your neck, you know, Hey, like, why aren't you doing all these different things? You got to have the, what, like the, the self-confidence. You got to have the, the discipline to turn back and say, listen, boss, we can do that. You're the boss, right? You can tell me what to do. And if I do that, it's going to come at a cost of these things that we know will produce these results, yeah. likely. Um, I don't think it makes sense for us to move on that, but override me if you'd like. like right. that, that's the conversation marketers need to have. And instead, what they do is they say, okay, yep, yeah, I can, mm -hmm. yep, I'll do that, yeah. Yep, I'll work on it right now. Like, what? Right now? Like at the cost of everything else? You right. Know, not, there's no discipline there. Right. Right. I, I, I remember when one time I was doing AdWords and, and the high up leadership wanted me to do, I was just a little, little Casey at the time, and they wanted me to do um, like kind of a brand attack, someone else's brand on AdWords, which for people that don't know, like if you try to bid as somebody else's brand, and and show up it, like you get penalized you get whacked so hard on on ad score because you're not that brand so your landing page is not that landing page like you are not that you're impersonating it and so you're gonna pay like 10 times as much as the brand itself to have your ad there and people aren't looking for you they're looking for that brand anyways and so i'm like we could do this landing page and we can try to get people from that but it's gonna be really expensive and it's not gonna and they wanted us to do it but you're, you're right you got to have some push but you got to be able to tell them like this this is actually not good, good practice, or this could be a waste. You know, let's, let's put this into a testing sprint later on, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. And pushing back on the non-primary, I mean, it's, it's mm. critical. There's 
it's like so many marketing feels like a creative sexy endeavor it feels to so many people especially the bigger the company is marketing starts to feel like you know beautiful women in front of brand new cars cool i grew up in detroit right we were doing detroit on, love it right um yeah and, and like beautiful women next to cars is like the perfect example of bad marketing <laughs> right you having that car if you're a guy or you know a woman or whatever like you're not going to get a beautiful person to love you because i mean maybe you will i don't know but like you probably won't like you probably need to move out of your mom's basement you know yeah. first you probably like need to take care of yourself first to like attract someone so it's like we're we're told these stories that branding is this uh, is this sexy thing mm -hmm. and marketing should not be seen as branding although branding is an element yeah. I think on a continuum, you should consider that you should be offer driven 70% of the time and have branding be, you know, 30% of all of your marketing efforts. Yeah. And, and maybe less. I mean, Bob Lai says that it should be 10% should be branding. Like literally in an ad, it should be your logo. I mean, there's not much room for anything else. Right. 10%. 10%. Yeah. 10% yeah. is a good number. I like that. It's like and, a small part. So, so to this, I think that there's this strategic element that I want to kind of speak to. Marketers aren't strategic. They are reactionary very often. Mm -hmm. They know only what they know. When, you know, the saying like, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. When you're, when you're a marketer, but like marketer is a overarching characteristic. Before we talk about marketers, let's talk about executives. A CEO, how does a CEO lead? They lead based on their experience. Yeah. Do they have military experience? Are they, a, are they a finance person? Were they a bookkeeper or a, a controller before? Are they a financially led CEO? Um, we're working with someone who was, a, was one of the top salesmen for Cut Code Knives. Wow. He's a salesman CEO, right? Like that's who he is. So the way he approaches the world is with his experience. Mm -hmm. And he can learn all these other things, but his background is come hell or high water, pick up the phone, make the sale. Mm -hmm. Everything else is like kind of icing on the cake, but it's yeah. like make the sale. So think of that for marketers. We're not just marketers. How did you grow up in marketing? Casey, like what was your first marketing job? You know, um, I was building websites for this company's clients. They were like this IT shop and I did websites for them. And then I also helped them on their radio show that they got for free because they donated some equipment to the station. So okay. Just a little bit of everything, you know, just yeah. the marketing. And it sounds like there's some content creation in there. Yeah. Yeah. Content creation, trying new things, um, building that assets. Maybe into like the part on email. I don't know if that's kind of the. No, this is back in the day. OG oh, days. Yeah. But yeah. And then another job where I was just doing reports, but yeah, just like my, I've had all sorts of different experiences, but I would say I'm a marketer. And so, you know, as I think about leading treasure impact, um, Thankfully, I've got brilliant people around me because otherwise I, I'm just, I would take everything back to marketing or the overall customer experience, the overall, you yeah. know, picture of how do we get more people coming in and helping them and content. So, I mean, my title, I even put like founder and CMO because I don't really feel like a CEO. I feel like, right. a, like a marketer still, you know? Yeah. And yeah, that makes sense. And, and I think that with us marketers, like I grew up, I graduated in 2008 into the housing crisis, right? So like recession, it's like, that's, that's where I cut my teeth. Yeah. I couldn't find a job. I was on the back of a lawn mower, um, mowing lawns the summer after I graduated. And, you know, I've got a degree in environmental policy, like kind of not an applicable degree. Um, I thought I was going to go study mushrooms, go be a mycologist, but the professor- Okay, hold on. Hold on. We, we didn't get into this. Who, who are you, man? Let, let's get into yeah. you because like, yeah, I, I know about the environmental thing and I want to get to that. Take us back. Take us all the way back to the beginning. What was it like being you- little Casey growing up, how did this all, like, how did your journey begin? Like at the very beginning? Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in uh, the Detroit area. Okay. Uh, and my dad worked for IBM. I was really lucky as a kid, you know, living in a subdivision, um, with a park around the corner, just like, a, you know, like a lot of freedom. Nice. And uh, dad brought home some of the first computers, you know, some of those really heavy computers. And yeah. uh, I was on Prodigy early and Prodigy was like a, you know, the old, like, that was weren't a, you a number on that? It wasn't until like AOL, you had got like a screen name. There was a Prodigy name. You had a name? Okay. Uh, yeah. We definitely had some kind of like username, but it was like, okay. and then like a bunch of numbers at the end. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
I, I think it was assigned. So we had Prodigy and then later on AOL and, you know, just kind of cut my teeth there. But ended up moving to a small town in northern Michigan when I was going into sixth grade, seventh grade, and went from a school that was, I don't know, like a class A school down to like a tiny school. My graduating class in high school was 97 people. Wow. And I think 95 graduated or 93 graduated. And that was the biggest class the school has ever had till the, to this day. What part of Michigan? Uh, the pinky. The pinky. Okay. I, I, I held up my hand, people. So I've learned that like the hand is basically Michigan. And so the pinky. Now, which, which way is the thumb? Is the thumb facing east or is that thumb facing west? Thumb faces east. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it touches pinky. Canada. Okay. So you're like, I, I've had some people on the team that are up, up there. You're up in the middle of no uh, tip of the pinky or? Yeah, kind of the tip of the pinky. Yeah, it's okay. like um, Green Bay, Wisconsin is due west. Okay. Uh, yeah, Madison, Wisconsin, like that kind of Sturgeon Bay. Um, so it's it's beautiful up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like where my mom's from. And I, mean, I went from like, you know, my mom working at a travel agency and my dad uh, working at IBM as a salesman. Sure. To now living in a small town. And like I moved there in the summer and like I had no friends. I mean, I lived on a road lived off a road called old orchard trail and there was still very much the old orchard there <laughs> the closest house to me was kind of a walk we moved to a small town you know a small more agrarian town did they, did they explain why like what why did they move yeah i mean dad retired and uh, uh okay he was starting to do consulting and he was flying out and he could fly to any airport and it's um near the hometown my mom grew up in got it okay so we went back there uh kind of sucks for you though <laughs> I thought, but man, I got to tell you, it was wonderful. Like, yeah. Every opportunity was available. Previously, I could never make the football team and I'm not much of a football player. Uh, I don't really care about, you know, I don't, I don't play sports much. Um, right. So going up to a small town, I got to try everything. I got to, you know, varsity letter for cross country, even though I'm probably the slowest runner you've ever seen. So I had plenty of opportunity. I really I see. Okay, cool. Yeah. And it was, it was a neat opportunity um, to be in a small town and, as a result, though, I found myself just like on the computer a lot, right? Just like as a kid would be in the summer, oh, like I had no friends, school hadn't started. So I just got on the computer. So that happened. Fast forward a couple of years. Um, I go to college to Michigan State. I think I'm going to be, uh, I don't know. I worked in the Senate um, as a Senate page. I worked okay. in my college lab. Like the so U.S. Like, Senate or the Michigan Senate? Michigan. Yeah, state of Michigan Senate. Cool. Uh, in, in the Romney building named after Mitt. Uh, Mitt, Rom Mitt, Mitt Romney's father. Yeah. So I'd, like I'd run papers back and forth for like the right. government to sign or another like house rep to sign or like whatever. Like that was my job. I was kind of like the Diet Coke getter, <laughs> which was cool. I got to see. So what was that like? I, you know, what was it like being a page for senators like that? Was it, was it weird? It was, was it cool at the time or? I thought it would feel more like there would, there would have a, like a, like a feeling of like, like like a weight to it, like a like a prestige to it. And yeah. honestly, it was just like everyone wore clip on bow ties and just like or clip on ties and they just like took papers around like we were just we were like grub hubbers, you know, we were just like delivering paper, <laughs> right? and, like picking up paper and it was fine. Um nothing wrong with a grub hubber either. Like right, but you, you were like expecting it to be like I'm serving my legislature, right. like I'm making People a difference. Know me. Someone yeah. would see me and be like, oh, Casey, I want to take you under my wing and show you how to become a, you know. Yes. Something like that. And no one cared. I mean, maybe <laughs> was, right. I was like a little done with the job and I had a longboard. So I just longboarded through the state capitol delivering paper and um, I had some of the, uh, the guards there stop me. Um, so I couldn't do that anymore. But, you know, just like pushing the edges on things, like trying yeah. to see what they the edge was right and the edge was like definitely don't skateboard inside the michigan capital right pretty clear so i had that job and i also had another job in college um i mean i was a janitor for a while whatever uh you know like cleaning toilets and um man you're like goodwill hunting right <laughs> just gotta stay busy man uh it was great though i had a grounds job so like part of it was like indoor in the student union but also yeah. grounds so i was like um you know, doing outdoor work and it was really nice. And Michigan you're State's going for like environmental science, right? Or something like that. Yeah. I went for environmental policy and cause it was like the political science bend. I have an yeah. uncle who, uh, who recently passed away, but he was like the longest living, longest serving, uh, uh, lobbyist in Arizona. 
Wow. So I get to spend time with him and like that seemed kind of neat and interesting. Um, but also like I really liked mushrooms. I think that they're very fascinating and I studied them in college a bit, worked in a lab uh, where we did chestnut blight. So we studied the, the fungus, it's called Cryphonectria parasitica and it's the blight that attacked the American chestnut that decimated the population. Huh. Uh, that was, it was neat, right? I got to so when you say mushrooms, are we, are we talking like Joe Rogan level mushrooms? Or are we talking just like, you know, good so at think, cooking mushrooms? So, so I think like, just like, in general, mushrooms are fascinating. Um, Interesting. Uh, Paul Stamets, uh, I've been following him for years, and he has like some thoughts or some proof around like micro remediation, how you can take a... Um, He's taken cattle ranches that have uh, like water runoff into a stream and then like tested the stream and saw that the stream had like really high counts of like fecal matter and you know, it's yeah. like really nasty. It's like all the runoff from the pasture. Into Got it. it. Yeah. So he like buried a bunker of uh, burlap full of wood chips that he inoculated with mushroom um, mycelium and has this bunker, which acts as like a myco filter, myco being mushroom, oh. and it would clean everything. And like the result is then you have mushrooms and then the birds would eat the mushrooms and like the water, that, the, the runoff then became clear. And like that stuff to me felt so. And it still that is cool. Like, that is cool. Yeah. So it's, we're not even talking like crazy mushrooms. We're talking about like mushrooms and how they have this cool effect of filtering things in a part yeah. of the environment. That's cool. Yeah. I just found it to be fascinating. And I thought that there was like some business opportunity there. Maybe Sure. Uh, he talked about doing like, here's an easy one. Uh, there are some mushroom varieties that eat wood. Some are like wood loving and some are non wood loving. Interesting. So, uh, of the wood loving ones, he took the spores of them, you know, grew a bunch, got all the spores out. Yeah. Um, put it in chainsaw oil, biodegradable chainsaw oil. So then when you go and you cut a tree down, you spread the wood eating mushroom spores on the stump and it eats the stump. So two years later, the stump's gone instead of having to do a whole thing to take the stump out what and it's natural right it's like it's eating it in a way that's naturally decomposing and then you have all of like the like the like the soil is there then for more growth it's not going to take over the planet and eat all the trees in your in your forest you could it could yeah yeah okay i think i think what he's doing is very cool so i was interested in that but ultimately i graduated college and i needed to find a job couldn't yeah. find anything i had really only one I wasn't a great student, right? 2.5 GPA. And yeah, you were pretty, I was pretty bad too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a 2.9. That's nice. My mom yeah. would have preferred that. Yeah. Either way, it's below three. If you're below three, you're kind of in the loser category, but then you go off to do crazy things. Right. So anyways, keep yeah. going. <laughs> no, it's a good point. Uh, I think seeing, I've got a lot of nieces and nephews and like seeing how they, are so concerned about their grades. Like, I think that, yeah, grades are important. I think discipline's important. And I think that it doesn't matter. Like it matters, but it does. It matters who you are and your ability to make good on your own bets and to bet on yourself. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense. Um, like, unless you can somehow maintain the Victorian, outside of that, it just doesn't matter. Mm, yeah. So, so I graduated housing crisis, 2008. Jeez. Awful. Couldn't find anything. I had one interview right at Canon copiers selling copy machines, a commodity. It was like one, one company selling a commodity, other companies selling <laughs> the same copy machines. I thought I could do it. They didn't hire me. So I think that was a blessing. That was a blessing. <laughs> had they hired me, I would have bought a new car because I needed one. I would have had rent and then the housing crisis. You know? yeah. Oh, geez, yeah. It would have been abysmal. So I... Uh, met a guy that I knew from the fire department. I used to work with the volunteer fire department. No and, kidding. Um, he gave me a job riding on the back of lawnmowers. So I had my own route and I'd go mow. And, and I'll just, I'll be honest. I just torrented and went to the library and got all the audiobooks I could. Like all the Tony Robbins stuff. Nice. Know, like three day Tony Robbins seminars, you know, during the week and just kind of like got my head on. And I think that that was just like a critical time for me. I was at this place of anything was possible. I could do anything. I could go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but like what, like what was my inner game? Mm -hmm. What was my self-confidence? What was my belief around money? What was my belief around my action or my activity and how I was able to like support myself and produce for myself. And, you know, it wasn't a fully fleshed out anything. 
but right. it was it was shaking loose some of the limiting beliefs that I had. During college, one of the things that was really lucky for me was I was a magician. So, me too. Yeah. No yeah, way. That's cool. Uh, uh, I lucked out. We had a small magic shop in Traverse City, Michigan. The guy <laughs> Tom there was like this really nice guy. And I would go in and we just talk magic whenever I could get into town as a kid. And out of the blue one day, a guy calls me. A guy named Greg calls me from a, a resort in town. And he goes, hey, we're looking for a magician. I was like, how did you get my number? <laughs> oh, Tom gave it to me. So as luck would have it, I got this gig as a magician. And I worked two nights a week. And I made 150 bucks a night. No kidding. Which when you're like in, it was uh, my senior year of college uh, in the summer and then two years. In no, that's decent, man. So, I mean, I, I had jobs right the whole day and you get a hundred bucks or something. So Right. So $300 a week working two nights, having the most fun. And yeah. also like a buffet and there's like a musician that I'm friends with. And like, he's playing songs for me. Like it was a ton of fun. Right. No it's like kidding. everyone's like at a resort and it was wonderful. And I took that as kind of this thought of like, what's leverage? Like I had a, I had a really good buddy who worked at a restaurant and worked his ass off. Yeah. I mean, had a work ethic that, that I, I didn't have. I mean, he would, he'd open and he'd close a restaurant and he would just be there all day and he would be making $300 a week. Yeah. Right. I made the same amount of money and I worked two nights and I got a free dinner out of it. I ultimately like bought a sailboat and just like would kick it in the summer. Cause like, I'm not going to go get another job where I got to go work you know, what, 10 times harder? Yeah. It's, it's, it's silly. So I just, you know, hung out. And as a result, I think that, that that plus a Tony Robbins stuff like that kind of brought me to this idea of what is leverage? How do I take control of things? How do I take control of my life and my situation? And I mowed a guy's lawn and um, he had a beautiful house. And I was just like, I guess, pretty direct. I just said to him one day, he came out and he was chatting with me. I was like, hey, can I just ask you, like, what do you do for a living? I'm talking like beautiful house on, yeah. on the lake. It's just like, ah, nice. He's got the car, you know, he's got the Rolex, like, you know, like what's he doing? And he goes, Oh, I invented a product and uh, I have a distribution channel to sell it. That's like, tell me about it. And he told me about it. I was like, can I sell it? He's like, yeah, sure. It's like, okay. Um, I don't have enough money right now to like buy stock. Can you front me? He goes, no. He's like, lesson number one is that you gotta like, you gotta buy stock. Yeah. Like, okay. So I waited a couple of weeks, I bought the stock and I went door to door in my small neighborhood and I sold more. I made more money in one afternoon than I made the whole week previous moon months. Wow. And I was just like, holy shit, there's something here, right? It was something, it was like something cool as opposed to like a pyramid scheme where it's like, you got to buy the cosmetics. Well, it was, like, I think in retrospect, it was kind of a sham. I mean, it was like a fuel conditioner. It was like magnets that you strap on like a, a gas line in your house. I didn't know any better. You know? Right, right, right. So, so that's where this whole marketing thing started for me. I said, okay, I have this thing. How do yeah. I sell it door to door? Well, gas is expensive. I also am just like kind of lazy. I like, I don't want to go door to door. Right. But like, I know it's successful. And I'm in a small town. I just like can't hit every door. Right. So I said, all right, how do I take this online? How do I kind of like merge all of this stuff? This is like leverage, like knowing that I, like, in Tony Robbins kind of way, like, Hell like, yeah. It's okay for me to have money. It's okay for me to like figure right. out what to do. So I ran and built a sales letter, studied Dan Kennedy, went that whole route and yeah. made like one sale, I think online, like turning point in my life. You know, do you remember the day? Do you remember like the, was it some like little moment it was magic or you got an email or something? It was like, bling. Yeah, I, I like, I still to this day when like a, like a, a new and different sale comes in, like, Play the music, dance around, scream a little bit. You know, you got to celebrate, man. You got to celebrate the, the the victories. You know, you got to because you, you feel the pains of the losses. Right. Might as well. Right. Celebrate. So yeah, I I had the product and then um, ended up meeting another guy who was in the information product space. Okay. And uh, started working with him. Um, met him at an event and he sent me a text. I'll never forget it. He sent me a text while I was driving to see my girlfriend down in um, like the Detroit area. Yeah. 2009, 2008. And he goes, Hey Casey, I've got a money making opportunity for you. <laughs> Call if you're interested. And I was like, yeah, you got it, David. I called him and he's like, yeah, I want you to run my Google ads. It's like, okay. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. Thousand bucks a month. I was like, you oh, got hell it. yeah. And what it was, was we had a copywriter on staff, but they just wanted some technician to run the ads. So I started 
writing the ads and like learning it. And I was, I studied Perry Marshall's definitive guide to Google AdWords and cool. that was given to me. It's kind of like my training. And um, I just like wrote a bunch of different variations. I knew how long it would take to test them. I found software called winner alert that allowed me to run different ads kind of on auto. So I took the thousand dollars and I did exactly what he asked for kind of in a day. And then for the next month, the ads would run and they would test against each other until we found the winners. And then I would just report weekly on the winners. Wow. So again, I found a way to have higher leverage Yeah. and deliver the result that he was looking for. Right. Still get the result, but you didn't necessarily need to do it. You were smarter than harder, right? You, were, you found ways to get the right result without necessarily needing to be mowing the lawn or working in that restaurant. You, you were smart right. about it. Yeah. And, and like mowing the lawn is like every week that grass has to get cut. Yeah. But for this, it was like one piece of software. I paid 20 bucks a month for it and it solved wow. the problem. So uh, then I took that girl friend of mine and she and I went on a bicycle trip. We flew into Madrid. We took what? a trip to Alicante, Spain, and we rode the <laughs> Mediterranean coast to Rome and we took four months to do it. The whole wow. time I worked remote, the whole time I was running my own thing. That's ultimately when I did the, the meditation retreat complete freedom. I was working a couple hours and like, yeah, I was only making like a grand a month, but I came home with more money than I had spent. And it was like a net benefit. And that guy who had hired me only found out that I was overseas when I was camping out at night because of the time zone difference in Italy in a small town on the top of like a hill by the library still in the Wi-Fi. And he's like, huh, Casey, well, what does that sound? That sounds like one of those like European cars driving up a hill. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm in Italy, you know, but I'll be home in two weeks. He's like, oh, cool. Hope you have a nice time. Right. Hey, as long as my ads are, are working full tilt, like I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. So like that, that helped me see leverage, but that helped me see process and like kind of taking care of myself, you know? Yeah. And I ended up working with um, different companies. I came back, lived in Ann Arbor in my sister's basement in 2009, which was rough. Ultimately, it was like, didn't want to live in Michigan anymore. Went down yeah. to Florida, stayed with a buddy. Went to New Orleans for a trip for my birthday just because I met a guy who said that he thought I belonged there. Yeah. So he seemed like he knew what he was talking about. Went to New Orleans, fell in love. Moved to New Orleans like 30 days later. Lived in New Orleans for, I don't know how long. Five years, six years, seven years? Yeah. And during that time, I became a professor at Tulane University. <laughs> right? Wow. There was a marketing professor there, uh, which was, was a marketing. Of- it wasn't environmental. It was the marketing you did. Yeah. Yeah. And like what, what the thing was is that I was like, okay, I'm working in marketing and I started picking up other clients, started working with an agency and, you know, was working with cool people and doing neat stuff. And, you know, we just raised like a million dollars on a Kickstarter. I felt wow. pretty cool. I was like, you know what? I should probably go get an MBA. Right. Yeah. So I look at the MBA program and I'm looking at Tulane. And I think Tulane's great, right? Tulane's like the best school down there. Their MBA program was atrocious, uh, right? So like they were doing like product placement, like as it, like uh, on a shelf, like put things on the end caps, put kid stuff lower down, like that kind of uh, stuff. <laughs> I don't need to go to school for that. That's not relevant. No one's talking about one click upsells. No one's talking about email yeah. open rate. No one's talking about, you know, analytics. So I offered to guest teach a day the professor said, sure, send me your transcripts. And I was like, no, like I'm embarrassed. They were so bad. And then she said, please send them. A year later, I finally sent them. I came and guest taught her class. She asked me to teach the next section. I did. She then asked me to lunch. Her husband was there. He asked me to teach the next section. Then they introduced me to the dean. The dean offered me a job. Like, wow. Great through, right? So I was able to then become the, a professor, which was great. And for three years, I did that. I had two classes, then later four classes. So I taught some like, I don't know, 500 students. Did you have the jacket with the patches on the elbows and the pipe? I was so disappointed, man. Like I had a hat, but then I went out to an event and I lost it. I feel like I need the Tulane hat, you know, Tulane prof hat or something. Oh yeah. 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 I have a photo of me before I left, like outside, you know, with my skateboard. Smoking jacket. Yeah. Right. Right. But that was like a really fun opportunity. And through that, I, this is what was important to me. I was like, how do I teach these students to be something instead of yeah. just say like, here's this dumb marketing thing. That's probably not going to be valid. I had to teach them a process. So this was my opportunity to create a process. Mm. What is the process that I can teach them? 
how do you think of an avatar, right? Like, what's the process for that? So I came up with a way to describe that. I came up with a, a, a geometric shape so that when you see the shape, you know what it means, right? And like the students were able to kind of remember those things. And I tested these different ideas, not just in the market with our clients that were doing New York Times bestselling book launches, raising that million dollar Kickstarter, doing million dollar product launches, like that kind of stuff. Not just that, but also with these students, how do they learn it? Yeah. That's what I built as a process. And that's ultimately now uh, where I am. So my wife and I left New Orleans. We sold everything. We left for three years on an epic road trip. We got an RV and drove around the country to wow. find a perfect city. We did the U.S. plus Toronto. Um, then fell in love with like so many different places. Ended up moving to Philly here. Um, wait, wait. So of all those places you could have ended up, you, you go to Philly? To Philly. I have so many good things to say about Philly. Cost of living is low. Um, if you're looking at real estate, there's opportunity zones here, which means Got that it. city wage and state income tax for 10 years or an hour's train ride from New York. Um, we have a great airport. Yeah, it's starting to make sense then. Yeah. I, see. I get direct flights home from, um, from, uh, Newark. Yep. So Newark's not terribly far. Um, good schools. It's a walkable downtown. It's the only city that had the New Orleans feel downtown. Like mm -hmm. if you go to Rittenhouse Square, it's kind of got that really yeah. nice magazine street french quarter kind of jackson square vibe sure uh and then you have old city in philly so we live just about 16 blocks north of old city so it's like i could walk down there with the dog and i just i really like the city um gigabit internet nice people hard workers it's got that um midwestern kind of kindness and like work ethic without being new york huh Right. And in New Orleans, love the city to death. Still wish I lived there most days. Um, but real estate's kind of a tricky thing there. The flooding's mm -hmm. pretty tricky. The termites were kind of annoying. I don't know. We gave up termites for ticks. So oh, I guess. Oh, God, right? Yeah. Which one would you rather have? You know, uh, termites. Yeah, I'll down. take termites too. Yeah. Yeah. Lyme disease is no joke. Yeah, seriously, right? These are yeah. the termites want wood and not you, you know? Right. Just like don't buy. We had friends who bought a house and then they had an inspector. Everything was good. And then a year later, they like, opened up a floorboard and like, you know, half their foundation was gone because the termites were there and the damn, you know, that kind of stuff definitely happens. But so we're in Philly and uh, we got married like while we were traveling and nice man. Where'd I you get married? That, what, like which beautiful location did you pick? Nashville halfway oh, between nice. my wife's family in Alabama and mine in Michigan. Yeah. We got married at the Skirmerhorn symphony center, beautiful kind of like art deco. And then we did a second line New Orleans style with a band from, Louisiana, they wow. walked us over to Acme Feed and Seed for like this, I mean, truly unforgettable wedding. We threw one hell of a party. And hell yeah. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was great. Uh, I had to take nothing back from that. Uh, and it was great because this was about us like defining who we are as people. And this kind of goes right. all the way back to that Tony Robbins tape on the back of the uh, lawnmower. This goes back to being a magician and finding leverage. And it's like, it's not easy, but we decided as a couple, I decided as an individual that like, I don't want to follow these basic tenets of like what a life looks like. Sure. I had buddies who had kids. Great. I'm excited for them. They have kids that are older. I'm kind of jealous. Like we've got a kid on the way. It'd be nice to have like a five-year-old now, you know? And, right. And I'm really happy with where we are. And we got to be where we are because we kind of bucked a trend yeah. and yeah. worked hard and worked, you know, really closely together. Um, and just like try to write rules that allowed us to win. And I want to go back to what this kind of means in our business. So I started a business, um, CMOX. I started this uh, the day after the wedding. It was like my kind of like mental escape from just like the wedding planning, living in yeah, an apartment yeah. Nashville while it was freezing outside. Like totally. Um, so I like bought the domain and like, you know, I was working on wedding stuff some days and then like also like building the website. But we kind of like launched the business effectively after the wedding. And it's this fractional CMO. And I think this is so, so interesting and so critical right now. A fractional CMO is absolutely needed right now. And it's how marketers can get out of the agency model or how agencies can add additional services that don't exist right now. Mm. The problem, there's, there's a couple problems. One, COVID is forcing businesses to reconsider uh, their staff. We're seeing marketers get laid off. We're seeing top agencies drop 20% of their people mm -hmm. right now. And like, we don't know what's going to happen moving forward. There's probably going to still be more cuts. So like agencies are cutting people. Um, you've got 
you've got businesses that don't want to spend full time on a CMO. A typical CMO, like a full time, is 173,000. That's what Glassdoor says. That's a lot of money to spend. I mean, you got to have a pretty sizable business to be able to afford that. Is it 173? 173. Jeez. Yeah. 173.6. Yeah. It's a lot of money, plus benefits, plus equity. If it's a startup, like that's a sizable chunk. And if you it want is. a marketer, you you either have to spend the money or you don't have it. Like there's no right. middle ground. And then for marketers, so many marketers are like in the agency, in an agency and they want to get out or owning an agency. And their issue is that they're, they don't have the time. They're not being compensated enough to be able to spend the time to solve the problems the way they know they can solve them. Yeah. So instead they're saying, like I was confided recently by a, a woman who is an SEO expert. She has 80, uh, 70 accounts, 70 accounts, 40 hour work week. That's 30 minutes an account. What can you get done, Casey, in 30 minutes? Not much, man. I can't even get a single podcast done in 30 minutes. <laughs> right? <laughs> so to that point, like marketers need to be able to spend more time if they want yeah. to solve more complex problems. Right. So the, the, like the, the, the formula is simple if you're not making enough in your agency or if you're not making enough as a marketer, the reason is that you're working with people that either don't, you're working with too many people that spend too little and yeah. then you're not able to solve more complex problems. If you solve more complex problems, you can get rewarded more. Yeah. I solved a problem for a company called Life Aid Beverage Company. If any of the listeners have ever been to a CrossFit gym or a vitamin shop, you've maybe seen the, like a Red Bull style can. Okay. It's like big in the CrossFit space for life. They have golf or focus aid, a couple others, really great products. Um, they have a CBD product that's uh, just coming out. Right. They were at $700,000 a month. Within 35 days, I got them to a million dollars a month. Jeez. And I got them there by identifying what was wrong, not fixing it. Right. I wasn't the technician that solved the problem. I was right. the person who identified the problem and told the technician what to do. Jeez. So the technician, all the value did, to that is tremendous value, tremendous value. Right. And it took me the same, whatever, four hours, 10 hours to figure out that it would take a technician to do something else that is of lower value. Yeah. So if you want to make more, you have to make a bigger impact and solve more complex problems. Yeah. And the way you can do that is you can become a fractional CMO, but to become a CMO, you have to think like a CMO. So this goes all the way back to that two lane class I taught, which is, have a process that allows you to make the right decisions. And if you can make the right decisions for your client because you follow a proven framework, then you're going to win. So I created something called the functional marketing framework, which is that. It is Love the it. process to become a CMO, like to act like a CMO, to think like a CMO. And Casey, you have bad days. I have bad days, right? Some days you, you got a headache, something's happened in your personal life, whatever. Oh, right? yeah. Like I look outside and when the sky's blue, I feel good. When the sky's gray, I feel a little grumpy, you know? Yeah, sure. But I still have to deliver. Yeah. So how do you deliver? Do you just dig deep? No. Like, no, you have a process. Mm. You have a predictable process that allows you to make the right decision. So when someone comes to you with an idea, what's your litmus to know if it's a good idea or not? What's the timeline to get that idea flighted? If you have a process to deal with that, kind of owning the marketing department, how yeah. do you manage? How do you ensure people deliver on time? How do you identify the most important uh, problems and figure out the solutions for them or figure out who can solve the problems? You can then command more money. Right. And that's the CMO. A fractional CMO can do that for multiple organizations. Right, right. It's huge, man. It's totally it's huge. huge. Yeah. How many hours does a CMO need to work in an organization? If you look at their 40-hour week, they'll spend 10 hours on strategy. They'll spend 10 hours really doing the highest leverage. 20 hours on a keep busy. Like they're writing emails or doing a newsletter and another 10 hours, just like, you know, mopping floors or, you know, doing whatever. But they really spend just 10 hours a week doing the most critical thing. Why not? Like if, if anyone listening to this is like me and wants to solve more complex problems and live in strategy, just, just do the strategy piece and then yeah. leave the tactician for tacticians. I never, I, I never want to do a part of email series. Casey, I hear your team's pretty good at it. Super. Yeah. You right. just tell us what you want us to write. You know, tell us what it should say, and then we'll just build it for you. You do the whole thing. Yeah. But you being a partner for me allows me to have more leverage. Right. I spend less time, I get a better result, right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. So I think that right now we're seeing a increase in the desire of a fractional CMO. Although I don't know, I don't think that necessarily there's a, it's in the lexicon. 
if you bring it up to a client, they'll be like, oh yeah, I want that, right? They know of an outsourced general counsel, right? No one has an in-house lawyer anymore, right? Right, yeah, yeah, same thing. Fraction. Same thing. They know a fractional CFO, that's pretty big. I think fractional CMO, I know it is, it's the upcoming kind of role. And I think listeners here would be smart to start considering how they can start offering those services. And to do that, they have to think like a CMO. Think like a CMO. Man, dude, we definitely have to come have you come back on here because uh, there's just so much to talk about. We could just geek out on Tony Robbins for a whole episode anyways. But I, I want to ask you a final question. And I know you got to go. You got a meeting coming up. Um, if you could hypothetically get in a time machine, I may have one in Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, hypothetically, if you could get in this time machine and go back and talk to yourself at the beginning of your career, wherever point in life you want that to be, maybe graduated undergrad and you're just like, hey, world – and you could talk to yourself, what would you tell yourself? What kind of mm. advice would you give? Like do more of this, do less of that, or <clears throat> what? What kind of things? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I was lucky with is I followed some people who were great. Yeah. Right? And I could see why they were great. I wasn't drawn into some of the more shysty kind of bait and switchy marketers. Right. Uh, and I was lucky about that, but I still had low confidence as a result. I didn't know what I was doing was right. I always felt like I was doing... I always felt dumb, honestly. Mm. I like, I didn't know what I was doing. I kept trying stuff. I had buddies who made a lot more money than me right out of college. And, you know, like their, their income grew with their benefit packages. And I right. didn't have benefits for years because I couldn't afford them. Right. Like, I always felt, I always felt like I was screwing up and I was going to get found out. Like, that was a real concern that I had, <clears throat> that I'd get found out by excuse me, by someone else or that like everything would just go to shit. If I could go back in time, I would just tell myself to bet on myself. Hmm. Right. Just bet on yourself. Just be honest. Um, there's a great book called uh, the road less stupid. Yeah. And in it, the author talks about think time, um, and, you know, carve out time for myself to think, have thinking time, have good questions to ask myself. Is this the best use of my time? Is this the best way to create, right? And just to bet on myself and bet on the relationships in my life. Those are the two things that I did do, but I didn't have confidence that I was doing them right. You know, I could have spent more time developing that. I could have spent more time there. Absolutely. It sounds like a uh, is stupid with Keith, Keith Cunningham, right? Keith Cunningham, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good, good book. Man, that, that's awesome. I know you're going to have to bounce here. What have you come back and – and um, maybe pick apart the, uh, the framework too, just the idea. But there's so much we talked about. So where can people, real quick, where can people connect with you after this? Um, either they want a fractional CMO or they just want to connect and, and keep learning from you or they need some tips on how to be a good magician, all the, all the above. Where, where can they reach yeah. out? I'm, like, I'm all about the retention vanish right now. So if anyone wants to learn the retention vanish, oh, it's a good magic trick. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if I know that word. We'll have to talk magic next one too. We'll have to get into that. Yeah, we should. Um, so to reach me professionally, uh, I've got a, just a presentation I put together, uh, all about being, becoming a fractional CMO. It's like the steps to become a fractional CMO and our company right now is looking for three marketers who want to become a fractional CMO. So if you're listening to this and you're interested, go check out the video. If the video is up, it means we're still looking. Uh, the address for the video is cmox.co slash invitation, cmox.co slash invitation and you'll opt in there uh, and, and watch the video it's about 20 minutes long and you'll kind of see what i'm saying about fractional cmos what a process can look like how you can do this in your organization and if you're interested in us in me personally training you one-on-one -on -one to become a fractional cmo and you know be able to charge three thousand five thousand ten thousand dollars or more a month per client um we've got just a couple spots available right now for that sick sick um we people will do that and you want to say hi on linkedin as well any other places um, reach out. Yeah. Get me on LinkedIn. That's cool. Um, yeah. Uh, dealing with my social right now, kind of figuring out as we have a kid, like we're going to kind of lock it down. So if you want, you can find me on Instagram, CS Stanton, C S S T A N T O N. But, uh, I'll probably be locking that down in a couple weeks. What about Twitter? So, are, you, are you active on that? No, I'm active. Yeah. Casey Stanton on Twitter. Okay, cool. Yeah, Sweet, yeah, man. Awesome. Well, hey, this has been legit. Thanks so much for coming on here. You are not dumb. Let me assure you that, uh, <laughs> I may feel a little bit. I'm going to have to listen to this one uh, maybe a couple more times. There's just so, so many nuggets. I don't know if you've written a book yet, but you need to. 
because there's so many just mic drop moments, so many nuggets. Um, yeah, dude. Thanks for coming. I got, on. I got one coming. I got one maybe 12, 18 months out. Hell yeah. As you should. Um, and we can, I'll share some, some book stories with you later on too. This has been fantastic. And for those people listening, if you've learned something, and I freaking know you have because I literally have two pages of notes over here and I ran out of space and I had to draw, draw lines and pictures and stuff. So if you learn something, share this with someone else. Get what Casey's talking about here. Get what the Casey's are talking about here yeah, out to other people so that they can learn and put your own flavor to it so you're being a thought leader. Put it on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, TikTok. I don't care. Put it out there right. and be a thought leader. If you do TikTok, you can own that platform. I won't touch it. Okay. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, anyone listening? Anyone listening? TikTok. We'll get you on there. We'll get you on there eventually. Casey, dude, thanks again for coming on here and looking forward to uh, continuing to learn from you. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Absolutely. And for everyone out there listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We will catch you all next time. All right. A big thank you to today's sponsors. Cheshire Impact, helping marketers and sales win, maximizing the use of Pardot and Salesforce. And a big thank you to Qualified.com, the number one live chat and chat bot platform for Salesforce and Pardot. Remember the giveaway. If you have Salesforce Pardot and you want a free copy of my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed, then you go over to Qualified.com, engage in the chat, do a demo, and tell them that Casey sent you and that book will be on its way to your door. All right, we'll see you on the next one.